Hello, lifters, and welcome to episode number 10 of Raising the Bar. I am here with Dr. Tamika Duncan, and I am so excited to have you on with us. I feel like we've been uh, old friends now for a while with our uh, interactions on social media, and I've been following you for quite some time now and just love what you're putting out and what you're about. Um, can you share with our lifters a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah. Hello, everyone. So thank you, Ashley, for having me on the podcast, first of all. Uh, but hi. Hey, guys. My name is Dr. Tamika Duncan. I am a physical therapist. Um, I have a practice of private practice called Vitality Sport and Rehab located in Clarksville, Tennessee. Um, I have been practicing for 12 years now, primarily orthopedics. I uh, love working with athletes. Um, and I'm a former athlete. I love to lift. I love to work out. I love to be active. So I feel like, hey, why not combine both of those worlds and try to create something that I love to do, right? Absolutely. That's what we're all trying to do out here. Actually, I saw on your Instagram page that you just hit a deadlift PR recently. Oh, man. Yeah, that was awesome. So it, this will kind of like as we get into our conversation, I can kind of allude to this a little bit more. But I stopped. I haven't deadlifted in like two years, probably. Oh, over that two years. <laughs> yeah, right. I haven't deadlifted over two years because I, I kind of strained my back a little bit. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to avoid all this heavy lifting. So I really haven't done it. But yeah, I was pretty proud of myself. Like, OK, we're about to get back in here. You should be. So you haven't deadlifted in two years and then you go and hit a PR. For right. a <laughs> exactly. Have you been rehabbing your back yourself? Of course. I, I, I'm, a, I'm going to admit to this therapist. We are the worst patients ever. We are because you know exactly what to do, but you are always focusing on working on everybody else. By the time I get home, it's like, I'm tired. I don't want to do this. But yes. So Absolutely. I have been rehabbing it myself. <laughs> Yep. Well, it's funny as a coach, like, I program for so many people. The last thing I want to do is program for myself. So mm -hmm. I'll often like buy other people's programs or I'll hire yep. a coach for me because, you know, yep. if you're writing 30 programs, I'm like, I don't want to write one for myself exactly. and it's better than me just winging it. So exactly. <laughs> totally understand that. Um, so I do want the topic of our conversation to be around pelvic floor dysfunction today. Um, I feel like from in the social media world, this has become a really, really hot topic of conversation. Um, and there's a lot of negativity around the disorder. Um, and a lot of it is coming from people who just don't have the education on it and don't understand too much about it and probably haven't experienced that themselves. So that's what I want to spend most of our time talking about today. Um, and you just recently started offering pelvic floor therapy in your practice. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, I just um, <clears throat> actually I just took uh, at that at where our PR that that deadlift. Uh, it was actually a um, an ICE course, which is the Institute of Clinical Excellence, their their pregnancy and postpartum course, uh, pelvic floor course specifically geared towards like lifters, CrossFitters, powerlifters, basically the athletic demographic. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, I took that this weekend uh, just because it's as a clinician myself, it's something that I've kind of run away from in my entire career, but the more that I dive into it, the older that I get to, and my body starts to change and, uh, you know, my age group, I'm almost 40. And so I still have, we're, you know, I haven't had any children, but I have friends that have had children. And so just listening to them and their complaints and it's like, okay, Hey, I know how to help you here, but you're talking about some issues down, un, down there that I don't necessarily know how to target. And so that really picked, you know, sparked me to say, okay, hey, I need to really start to dive into this because I want to be able to offer a complete package of care for someone versus, you know, okay, hey, I got you 85% better, but because of my own lack of knowledge, I couldn't resolve the pelvic floor component. So that's what really kind of sparked my interest. And so that course this weekend was just like, wow, I'm, I'm so um, excited just to kind of grow more into that and then just start to really offer that to the community. So. Oh, that's really exciting. Um, can you kind of dive into specifically what pelvic floor dysfunction is and what people experience when they're dealing with that? Yeah, absolutely. So first I'll start off by just saying, explaining what the function of the pelvic floor is, right? So pelvic floor, it one supports our, the organs above. So organs above meaning like our bladder, the vagina, the uterus, um, you know, in all those other intra-abdominal organs. So mm -hmm. the pelvic floor, it sits on the bottom. It one goal, it just supports, right? Second goal is to maintain bowel and bladder um, continence. So, you know, being able to eliminate on demand or when you need to. 
Uh, and the third thing the pelvic floor does is it contributes to our sexual function, of course, for arousal and orgasm. So those are the three main functions of the pelvic floor. So of course, uh, with the dysfunction, that means that something is going on to, to impede those three functions. So a lot of times what that may look like, um, like in our lifters or athletic demographic, that may be uh, pelvic uh, prolapse. Um, you know, women may experience prolapse. It may be, okay, you become incontinent with lifting, whether you're urinating or defecating or, uh, you know, passing gas when you're lifting. Um, and then of course, um, you know, this happens with athletes as well, but you know, painful intercourse, um, you know, so you may see that. So in terms of dysfunction, in terms of the function and dysfunction, that's what that looks like. It can also look like, um, like when you're lifting or putting a lot of load on you, you have this, all, you all of a sudden have this urgency to go and mm -hmm. you can't really control it. So it's like, oh, okay, I got to run to the bathroom, come back, you may be fine or you have this urgency to go, you try to hold it and then you leak, right? Uh, or it can be, when I talk about the prolapse, it can be, okay, when you're exerting yourself, you may feel a fullness or a heaviness or some type of bulging pressure down in the vaginal area. Um, it could be constipation, you know, from tightness. Um, it can be a change in periods or just difficulty with, difficulty or, again, for sexual, sexual health, difficulty with um, orgasm or things like that. So that's kind of like the function and talk, talking about like some of what the dysfunctional patterns may look like when it comes to pelvic floor. And, and with these issues, obviously they are more common in women than they are in men, but it is not unheard of for men to have these same issues. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. A lot. I mean, it'll present, it'll present similarly. Of course, our organs are different, but you know, um, you know, pain, they may have painful pain with intercourse. They may have, um, inability to um, get erect, you know, with sexual, uh, in terms of the sexual health, constipation, um, leakage with lifting, you mm -hmm. know, whether that be urinating or defecating as well. So absolutely. And now the, the symptoms, obviously, like run the gamut as far as severity goes. So they can be like very, very mild symptoms to, you know, the worst of the worst, right? Which is what a lot mm -hmm. of people hear. Um, and like I said, there's been a lot of conversation about social media and there's a lot of very popular lifters now that are being more open about these types of issues and just kind of bringing it to the forefront. Um, but from it being like a severe medical condition where you do need to get treatment for it, like what type of symptoms would someone be experiencing to where it would be a warning sign for something a little bit more serious? Yeah. So I think this is where the education piece comes in because even as just a traditional therapist that treats just general orthopedic injury, I always let, I, one of the things I always say is, hey, look, if you have pain somewhere and it's lasting more than two weeks, it's not resolving. You've tried to self-treat, you've tried to do this and it's getting worse or it's just not getting better. That's when you need to start to seek medical attention, right? So in terms of the pelvic floor world, um, you know, let's say you are someone who, for whatever reason, you, you've been, you were fine before and you started noticing, you started noticing pain with intercourse, mm -hmm. you know, or you're just getting just this random discomfort, you know, in that area. It's like, okay, something's going on. It's not really severe, but it's just different. Or when you're lifting, you're noticing just some discomfort down there, or you're starting to notice some fullness. Um, or let's say you're, a, you're postpartum, you just, you just had a baby, or you're pregnant, and you want to continue to be active you know, but you're kind of concerned because a lot of times, you know, the stigma is, okay, hey, you're pregnant or you're postpartum, you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, not necessarily, you know, I mean, everybody's different, uh, but but that's where you seek the, the guidance of a skilled clinician to be able to properly guide you through what may be beneficial for you, what may be helpful for you. So it may present as mild symptoms, such as, like I said, just mild discomfort or pain that comes and goes, or you may notice, okay, hey, I laughed today. Like, let's say you're postpartum. Hey, I laughed and I peed and I kind of leaked on myself. That that wasn't happening before. So, you know, okay, I'm noticing some changes down there. And one of the things that when you talk to a lot of women, because of, of course, I think women will be a little bit more expressive with this than men probably would be. Um, a lot of times these symptoms are common, but this not that doesn't mean that they're normal. Right. So a common, you know, it's common that, okay, postpartum as a woman, yeah, you're going to have, you know, 
things have gotten weak, you may leak a little bit. That's a pretty common complaint that you hear around hear from a lot of women, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's normal. So in cases like that, that's where I'd say, okay, hey, go consult with the pelvic floor therapist to just at least be assessed and see if there's anything that 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 you may be able to benefit from in terms of treatment. Now, because that is so common with women who have just given birth, um, and it amazes me all the time, like how quickly a woman's body will bounce back from that trauma, right? As far as time frame goes, it, does it differ from person to person, or does that recovery process and women bouncing back from having those types of incontinent issues, um, does that happen pretty quickly, or is treatment necessary in order to rebuild? Um, I, it definitely, I say differ, it differs from person to person, you know, it, it depends on um, how active they are before pregnancy, during their pregnancy, you know, you have some women who are, you know, let's say they're, they're, they work out consistently, they do their part to try to stay strong, you know, so their recovery, I always tell people before, the stronger you are going into any type of surgery or you have any type of trauma, that rehab process is going to look a lot better and right. a lot different. You're going to rehab a little bit quicker um, as compared to someone who may not have been as active, you know, so they're, they're not as active. They're a little bit weaker starting out. And then of course, under when, when you're pregnant, the body changes, muscles get, you know, ligaments get stretched, muscles get a little bit weaker. So their recovery process may look a lot different than someone else. So you have like these timelines, but again, it's patient dependent. Um, but that's why, again, just advocating for, you know, those individuals to actually seek a pelvic floor therapist to get that one-on-one -on -one individualized care for what your needs are as compared to just going off for a general consensus. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Now, like transitioning into strength athlete specific, whether like Olympic lifter, CrossFit or power lifter. Mm -hmm. uh, now, those athletes are putting their body under a crazy amount of stress, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of trying to figure out again, whether or not this is a like medical condition or just something because you put your body under so much stress, would it again, just go back to, has this ever happened before? Yes or no. If not, then it may be something that you look into or at what point again, common, but not normal would like a female lifter, like what type of load would a female lifter experience something like that to the point where she shouldn't necessarily be concerned? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So yeah, it, I think, yeah. So I think it depends on, so I'll kind of, I'll, I'll kind of talk about this. So when we talk about pelvic floor, the two things that it's a couple of things that stand out to me, like what I think about. So like the most common thing that we hear about with lifters is leaking, right? Mm -hmm. You lift a heavy load and oops. Okay. So for me and for your pelvic floor therapist, the thought, the first thought is, okay, there is an intra-abdominal pressure issue. So because I've lifted this load, I've increased this intra-abdominal pressure. And now because this system is imbalanced in some way, now I'm leaking, right? So just to kind of give the audience just a, a, a general, a quick understanding of, of what um, I guess a normal pelvic floor, like what how breathing affects the pelvic floor and all of that. So um, when we inhale, as we inhale, that that air comes in and, and it increases the intra, you know, we get the intra abdominal pressure increases. But as we inhale, that pressure, that air goes down and it pushes down on the pelvic floor, right? So that, in a sense, we kind of, that helps relax the pelvic floor. Traditionally, a lot of women are very, 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 very tight in, in our pelvic floors. So if I'm really, really tight and I'm trying to breathe in, a lot of times if we're really tight, we have a hard time being able to actually release. You know what I mean? So that balances off. I'm really tight and I'm trying to tell myself to release something, but I don't know how to do it. I have to retrain that pattern. So in normal pelvic floor function. When I inhale, I naturally will relax the pelvic floor because that pressure kind of goes down. When I contract or do an abdominal brace, the, you know, the thought is, okay, I'm contracting the pelvic floor and it, and it slightly raises to help provide more support. So when you're lifting, a lot of times we say there's a pressure management issue. Is there something going on within that system? That's all. Whether the pelvic floor is not strong enough to contract to support the load um, whether the pelvic floor is really, really tight 
and you're trying to do your breathing, but it's not able to release to, to, to do what it needs to do. Uh, it could be other muscles are weak and now the pelvic floor is compensating to try to, to try to take up for the slack of the other muscles. Um, so it, I hate to say it, but it depends. Yeah. Well, with all of this, there's not a one size fits all. Yeah. Answer, which it, you know, is what a lot of people look for, but unfortunately it's not the case, but, um, still excellent information. So you said that as women, like we tend to be really tight through the pelvic floor. Is that, something that is within our control? Is there something that we can do to help like normalize that and make it relax a little bit? Mm -hmm. So, yep, you can definitely. So, um, you know, uh, tightness again, some of the signs I'll just kind of go over some of the signs of what tightness may look like. Um, tightness may present as, you know, pain with intercourse. Mm -hmm. Um, it can be, like I said, constipation. It can be having problems, being able to defecate, you know, use the bathroom, so it just kind of like you, you find that you have to strain a little bit more than what you would anticipate. Um, but in terms of trying to do like some self-treatment things to relax that area, first thing is definitely breathing. I think any, any pelvic floor therapist that you go to, they're going to assess your breathing. What does your breathing look like? Because again, that breathing component plays a huge role in, in what happens at the pelvic floor. So uh, when, if the individual is really, really tight, we will definitely address and start to work on just basic breathing. A lot of times, if you master that breathing and you get that breathing right, that will clear up a lot of issues. It's like, man, I didn't, I just focused on breathing. I know we focus on breathing. We get that coordination right. Yep. And it literally just helps, you know what I mean? It just helps bring it all together. And if the pelvic floor is working the way it needs to, the, the, you know, that core, if it's working the way it needs to, you're going to notice that you can lift more, you can do more, you know, be more functional without having these issues. Um, so definitely deep breathing, diaphragmatic breathing is one. Another, um, it's like different stretches. You can do like some self-massage techniques. So um, like if a lot of, a lot of times, if you would get like a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball, Whatever is most comfortable for people, um, it may vary. Some people may be a little bit more sensitive down there. But um, another good self-treatment technique would be like if you sit down and you kind of put your hand under your, under your bottom, you'll feel your sit bones. Mm -hmm. And if you take a lacrosse ball or a tennis ball and just put it right on the inside of that area and kind of just move it around and, and see if you can find a trigger point or an area that's, that feels really, really tense. And just kind of hold it, sit in that, you know, ret, um, put it in that area for 30 seconds to 60 seconds just to provide some relief. Um, you know, so that's another great way to just start to address like uh, tightness. Um, so breathing, self-massage. You can also do um, just, just different techniques like, um, well, no, I won't say that. If if those things don't work, then that's where I say that's where you need to go to a to a pelvic floor therapist because you may be an individual who actually need internal work. So a lot of those pelvic floor muscles they're deep, um, and sometimes you know we can do things superficially, you know, where you're stretching or you kind of massage the glute area, but sometimes you actually need to, you know, do an internal assessment or just have a therapist do some internal work to release those muscles. And then once things have been released, then that's when we can start to build on working on the proper function, strengthening certain things up the way they need to be strengthened and, and working on that coordination piece. Gotcha. Um, yeah, with that lacrosse ball technique, I never would have thought to use it in that way. I use lacrosse balls all the time, literally mm -hmm. everywhere else, but I never would have thought mm -hmm. to do that. So I learned something <laughs> nice to you. I'm learning yeah. a lot, actually. Um, you know, I, I always tell my clients, you know, when they are using lacrosse balls and they like make this really uncomfortable face, they're like, oh my gosh, that hurts so bad. I'm like, that's exactly where you need to have it then. Yeah. So it sounds like it's the same thing for that. Yep. And with the pelvic floor, so you, so with the pelvic floor, you have to be, you want to be gentle. You want to give a release, but you want to be gentle because, and this is, this is true for every aspect of the body. Like when people come in, let's say we're doing like releasing, I don't know, glutes or, you know, you're doing a doing a release on your lats or, or subscap, like, yeah, it's going to be, it's going, 
some things that they just are uncomfortable, but you don't want it to be to the point where you're like on the brink of tears, right? Of course. Because yeah. I tell <laughs> I tell people, I'm like, I'm like, it's going to be a little uncomfortable, but if it's too uncomfortable, it's just going to be counterproductive because now your body's going to tense up even more. Okay. It's even more guarded. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do this, guys, be gentle with yourself because you can pot you can potentially make things worse down there uh, if you go in too aggressively. So. <laughs> And with pelvic floor dysfunction, is there any correlation between that and like hip lower back issues with women? Oh, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. So a lot of times what you may see, um, so I kind of mentioned earlier, like the pelvic floor may be tight because there is a weakness in the hips or a weakness in the back. So those areas are so closely related like you may have weakness or tightness or limited range of motion, let's say in your lumbar spine or your lower back or in the hips. So as a result, okay, if my hips are tighter or I don't have that range of motion, my glutes may not be firing the way they need to, but our bodies are so smart. They're going to say, hey, we need to get the job done. So we're going to recruit and use whatever muscle we need to, to get this job done. It may not be functional you know it may be a dysfunctional right. movement pattern but we're right. going to get the job done yes. so absolutely you, they they go hand in hand for sure like as a therapist you know when somebody comes in if they have back pain or hip pain if somebody comes with with any type of lower extremity pain the first thing I always look at is the lumbar spine the lower mm -hmm. back because a lot of lower back issues will mimic lower extremity issues and it's like you're treating the knee you're treating the ankle you're treating the foot but the issue is really coming from the back um, so yeah, there is definitely a lot of correlation between those three. Yeah. Everything connects. One thing goes wrong and everything else it, just seems yes. to follow the suit, right? Like <laughs> it, it's really not that, but that'll fix itself. Yeah. To fix this issue. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Uh, it, it's crazy how the body works. Um, exactly. I mentioned this before on a, another podcast with a, another physical therapist that I was talking to and I had hurt my, um, hip about a year and a half ago. And mm -hmm. it was my very first like severe injury as a lifter, which I'm so happy that I made it that far. Um, mm -hmm. But it was my pectineus muscle oh, and yeah. it wasn't torn, but it was severely strained to the point where like I couldn't move my leg in any direction. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, me being the, you know, just move on and keep going. It's fine. It's going to yep. hurt. Like, not, <laughs> not the best advice, but again, like coaches, physical therapists were the worst. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I kept trying to squat and of course it wasn't working. Um, and one thing that I found really interesting is after a couple of weeks of dealing with that pain and discomfort, my glute on the, the side where I had my hip injured, my glute completely just deactivated and went flat. Yep. Now I'm not going to toot my own horn, but I got a little bit of a booty. And there you go. <laughs> I, one, one side was looking normal. And then the other side was a pancake. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> um, but it was like, I had, I didn't do anything to the glute, but just the way that it reacted, I found was yeah. very interesting. And, you know, it's just a way to, for your body to protect itself and prevent you from hurting that same area even more. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And after going and seeing a physical therapist, like we resolved the issue and I'm back to normal, but, um, it was just so interesting to see how the body reacted that way. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and that's the thing, like using that example, that's one of the things that like, I really let lifters know, you know, like lifter or athletes period, because, you know, as an athlete, you have an athlete's brain, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, tr you're just programmed to, okay, yeah, it hurts, but I'm, I'm just going to push through. Yep. But it's sometimes if we push through, it's like, no, we're actually, we can actually be making things worse, you know, resolve the pectineus issue or resolve the, the hip issue. So we don't now create a back issue, right? You know, because now the glute isn't firing to support yeah. your back like it needs to, oh, or yeah, now we create a knee off. issue. <laughs> yep. <Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. laughs> you know, so yeah. And, and you know what, I would be, I want, um, you know, sometimes just even from what your what that complaint was, sometimes you know, the pelvic floor probably could have was compensating a little bit as well. Very well. Uh, we can go into more personal stuff uh, with me yeah. once we get offline here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll bring you bring about a couple things. <laughs> but the world doesn't need to know my personal issues. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so is there some type of like preventative um, 
like movement, strengthening, corrective, like, is there anything that women can do to prevent this from happening? Because I'm going to make the assumption that as we get older, this is more likely to be an issue. Yeah, I think the biggest thing overall is being active. You know what I'm saying? Just overall strengthening, being active, um, keeping the core strong, abdominals, glutes, hips, just being strong overall. And if you start noticing any of these mild things that, that we've discussed, whether it be, you know, pain in the vaginal area, pain with intercourse, or you're noticing that, okay, I'm, I'm noticing some issues with my ability to be able to control my urine or my, or my bowels, you know, jumping on top of seeing a therapist soon, much sooner rather than later, right? But I think in terms of prevention or trying to maintain it, the biggest thing is staying active, trying to keep that core together, focusing on your breathing patterns when you're lifting, you know, um, you know, making sure just 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 being very intentional about breath support and breathing and mobility, because the more mobile we are, the stronger we are, the body can work efficiently as we start to lose those things. And that's when we start to develop those compensatory strategies and, you know, different muscles start to kick in and try to help help the other out. Um, but I would say but best prevention, try to stay as active as possible. Those women who are pregnant or postpartum, again, with the cons con consulting with your with your physician and your physical therapist, you know, but trying to stay active throughout the course of your pregnancy um, and then just slowly building yourself back up to um, to your tolerance at, after you give birth. But I think the biggest thing is, extra, you know, just being active and maintaining that mobility. And if and when you start, if you notice anything, then definitely consulting with, with uh, the necessary provider to, to get an assessment to see what's going on. Yeah. And if you, if a lifter finds that she is having these issues, if she's taking the like preventative measures and doing all of the things that she needs to have as far as needs to do as far as the rehab is concerned is it mm -hmm. safe for her to continue to lift as she's doing the rehab absolutely yeah so as a physical therapist one of the things that we we advocate movement right so mm -hmm. we may have to modify you know so okay let's say i don't know let's say you're lifting 185 you know okay hey we may have to as we as we retrain and address the coordination component of your breath and and get muscles firing we may not be lifting at 185 we may need to drop you down to 135 now but as we build we can progressively load you back up so definitely i think but of, of course again it's going to be patient dependent but yet the goal as a therapist it's always to maintain movement always to keep you going and active we may have to download just a little bit but the goal is to build you back up, you know, progressively load you back up as we address those areas of deficit. Gotcha. Yeah. So as far as like the, the mental aspect of it, right? Because I'm sure as a physical therapist, just like with a coach, there's a huge mental coaching component to it. Mm -hmm. I, I could imagine, like, I feel very thankful that I've never experienced this, but I could imagine the just the amount of like mental pressure there is to like continue to lift with these issues, um, especially mm -hmm. being in, you know, public gyms or commercial gyms, you know, whatever the case may be. What are some tools that women can use in order to either push past that mental barrier or just some ways that they could deal with that? I would say one, give yourself grace. I think, I mean, truthfully, I think, I think that just given, given ourselves grace, one, especially if you're postpartum, right? Because there is so, there is so much societal pressure on us as women. Okay, you have a baby today. Next month, you need to be back to your pre-pregnancy weight. Mm -hmm. No, like your body just went through a huge transformation over nine months. And so guess what? And it went through an extreme amount of trauma too, whether you had a vaginal delivery or a C-section, right? So we have to allow our bodies to heal. So one, I would say, give yourself grace, right? But two, creating small goals as markers to see your achievement, right? So, okay, yes, prior to this, you may have been doing CrossFit four or five days a week, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, you may not be doing the high level uh, double unders or things like that that you were doing, but you can still do CrossFit. You may have to just scale it back, right? But create small, smaller victories. Okay, my goal this week is to be able to jump rope, just jump rope without having leak, leakage issues, 
Okay, we mastered that. Okay, guess what? Next week, my goal is to be able to do singles, but then do a couple double unders without leaking. You know what I mean? So not negating, not saying that you can't be active, not saying, but we we just have to um, set smaller goals and so that we can see like, okay, I'm not there yet, but I am making measurable changes. I'm making measurable gains to get back to where I want to be. And understanding, I think this is very important, especially on the rehab process as a therapist. Rehab looks like this. Overall, and if those who can't see me, basically what I'm doing is like a, a, a line. So we're, we're still moving up, right? But in that movement up, there are going to be times where I dip down, but overall, I'm still moving up. So that's what rehab looks like, whether you're rehabbing a knee, whether you're rehabbing the pelvic floor, building that strength back up, you're going to you're you're going to keep moving forward. But sometimes in that process, there may be a week or a couple of days where you're like, dang it, what's going on? But if you compare where you are today to where you were two weeks ago, you should still see an improvement. Absolutely. So I would say biggest thing, give yourself grace, set smaller, measurable goals to get you to that final goal. Uh, or whatever that goal is and getting you back to returning to being back to where you want to be. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. And, you know, women, we are very hard on ourselves and there is mm -hmm. so much societal pressure around a lot of different things. And actually I heard um, a comedian talking about women who are on their periods having their cycle and I actually mm -hmm. had to look this up because I'm like, that can't be true. Like either, even as a woman, I didn't believe it, but it, it is that how, marketing around, you know, sanitary products and stuff like that is so you can get back to doing what you love to do. And, you know, it has a, an image of a woman riding a horse or doing all these crazy things, but the amount of pain that women feel with menstrual cramp cramps mm -hmm. is equivalent to having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And the comedian was saying that it sounds ridiculous to tell a man to go ride a horse as he's having a heart attack. I'm like, just deal with it. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just get back to do normal things. Like that just sounds ridiculous. Right. And and I think it's funny because you know women have a higher pain tolerance than men. We have to. Mm -hmm. And you know dealing with those things for the majority of our lives and just getting used to it. I'm like that can't be what a heart attack feels like. Right. I, I actually had to look it up, and like the the pain intensity is right around the same. I'm like that's crazy. I could have a heart attack. Right. That'd be good. <laughs> <You're not> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's, it's just crazy. And I think that we, we do put a lot of pressure on ourselves, like just to get back to doing what we should be doing all the time, mm -hmm. you know, despite what our bodies go through regularly. And, mm -hmm. you know, just, it, there's a lot of pressure involved with that. So there is. Yeah, yeah. There definitely we, is. we definitely need to give ourselves a little bit more grace there. Um, yeah. So for people who have additional questions about pelvic floor and want to reach out to you, what's the best way for people to go about doing that? Yeah, so I am on, um, you know, you can I put content out on social media. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on Instagram, Facebook. You can find me uh, both in both locations by typing in at Vitality Sport and Rehab. Um, and then on those, of course, on those pages, you can, um, excuse me, it has all my contact info. Uh, my website, www.vitalitysportandrehab.com. Um, yeah, it, ha it has all the contact info there. You can reach out to me. I love answering questions. Like I love, the biggest thing is I love educating people. Whether you come to see me personally, whether it's I just give you some knowledge and you go and I love educating people. So if people have questions, please feel free to reach out. If I do not know the answer, I am blessed to have a network of clinicians that I can pick their brains, right? So um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, if they want to reach out, I'm more than open and welcome to you doing that. Awesome. And I'll make sure to put all that information in the notes of this podcast too, so people can just easily clink, click and get linked to you. Um, well, I really appreciate your time. This is very educational for me. Um, I, to my knowledge, and this isn't something that I'm sure a lot of women like to share, but to my knowledge, I have not worked with any women that have pelvic floor issues. So this is definitely a learning experience for me. Um, and I, I will probably be following up with you with some additional questions just personally and yeah. in, in the future, if I do have any, um, clients that are going to be dealing with this issue. So, um, I really appreciate you coming on and chatting with us. Um, and again, I'm going to put all of the, your information in the notes of this podcast. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Tamika. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.